but see you come on Sunday. Thank you for coming, by the way. There's a big concert downtown. How many of you knew that? Um, it's, uh, I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's uh, Michael Jackson and uh, the, the, the Fifth Dimension or something like that. I don't remember, but a lot of our people are there, and uh, so, and I just want you to know, since it's a church event you're at, I, I excuse you, but I will see you at the musical next Sunday night if you're looking back on this. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd really appreciate you being Sunday night. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. Matthew chapter 22, uh, Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. I don't know where I got Matthew 22. Matthew 1. So I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit Christmas. Listen, the Holy Spirit is God on earth and God in us, and it's what causes us to be born again. It's what quickens the word. It's what empowers us. It's what gives us gifts of the spirit to operate. It's what pours his true fruit through our life, that supernatural fruit that we might look and like Jesus so that they would call us Christians as they did at Antioch because they were so much like Christ. And I'm gonna tell you, Christmas is a Holy Spirit Christmas, a Holy Spirit event. It, it, it is the coming of the Spirit in a special way. Before Acts 2, the Holy Spirit is involved right here. And I want you to, to pay close attention. I don't have real long, but I just want to share with you. Number one is that Jesus was Spirit born. Matthew 1, verse 18 to 20. Now, I've got the NASB, and it's a little different on the screen, and that's okay. The birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, which she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that made Christmas happen, that put the seed of God in Mary, that God would be the father, Mary the earthly mother, and she is blessed and favored, and we need to honor the memory of Mary. She's not God. We don't worship her, but Mary was a special one that was chosen by God for the most important, most special person ever to be born, Jesus Christ, God's own son. And, uh, and I, I will tell you, the Holy Spirit's integral role uh, was with, with uh, uh, in, the, in the birth of Jesus Christ, very significant. And so the, the, Jesus, Jesus was born of a virgin. And I, mean, I think you all know what that means. But it's, 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 it's crazy that God's plan to actually come upon Mary. Now, I think back to the Old Testament and the breath of life into Adam. When he formed Adam and breathed, he breathed life into him. This same breath of God, the breath of God breathed upon Mary and put Jesus within her. And that same breath of God, of the Holy Spirit, breathes on us when Jesus' Spirit causes us to be born again and comes within our lives. And that same Holy Spirit breathes on us daily the breath of life the life-giving breath that refreshes us and that causes us to have his spirit and power in us. The breath of God is very important to us, and we need it. Luke chapter 1, verse 35 also is another mission. And I just want to read it from there just so you see it. Luke 1, verse 35, it says this. The angel answered and said to her, to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. It's because the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, breathed upon her. The Holy God has put Jesus Christ within Mary and she's born. I believe Christmas is the most important event in the annual calendar to remember the birth of Christ. Without his birth, there is no death. 
He chose to come from heaven's throne here to a dark, sinful world knowing that he was going to suffer and die on a cross that we might live and have our sins forgiven. And not only that, but that he could become, as Isaiah prophesied, Emmanuel, God with us, God in us, God revealed in us, God with us. That's how the Holy Spirit is with you. God himself by the Spirit is in you and is with you. So the role of the Spirit in the conception of Jesus is significant because it points to the fact that Jesus is Israel's Messiah, born of a virgin. The Holy Spirit enabled the incarnation as the Spirit creates, sanctifies, and unites the divine Son with the humanity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Spirit-born. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary. And not only was he Spirit-born, Jesus was Spirit-filled. We are also Spirit-born, aren't we? Born of the Spirit. I speak of not going back into your mother's womb, Jesus told Nicodemus. It's not that kind of rebirth. It's spiritual rebirth. And it's supernatural rebirth. It's not a joining of a club or a theological viewpoint. It's a power event. The same kind of power event when the Spirit came upon Mary and put Christ in her. The Spirit comes upon us and we're born of the Spirit. And Jesus is Spirit-filled and we are to be Spirit-filled. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, I love this verse. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, You're the Son of God. Tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let me tell you, Jesus used the word, but he was Spirit-filled when he was tempted. And then he was tempted again, and he was tempted again, and he quoted the word both times. And then you get down to verse 13 in Luke 4. Guess what it says? When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. He didn't give up. Let me tell you something. You need to spirit fill life all the time because if you start living by the flesh, I'm telling you, for every human being that ever lived, the devil is looking for an opportune time. I was reading where 50% of evangelicals don't believe in a literal devil. Well, let me tell you, the Bible says the devil roams around looking to whom he may devour. He is after you. He wants to destroy you. He's coming after you. He whispers to you. And his chief tool is to lie, to tell you how bad you are to tell, to whisper against others, to whisper what others are thinking of you when they're not even thinking of you, what they're saying about you when they're not even talking about you. The devil will use insecurity. He will use paranoia. He'll use anything to discourage you, and he will come against people that lead people spiritually so that you're discouraged and walk away. The devil it comes from every side to try to destroy you, and you cannot afford to live in the flesh. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led to, in the wilderness and to be tempted of the devil. We're going to be tempted of the devil, and we need the power of the Spirit and the quickening of his word to be filled up with him so that we can overcome the tempter, Satan. Jesus was full of the Spirit and full of the word, and he overcame him. Look at, look at verse 14 now. Look at verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan, Luke 4.1 and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Verse 14, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news spread about him in the surrounding district. Why? Because when you're in the power of the Spirit, and you're full of the Spirit, there's spiritual things that happen, and God does powerful things. I remember when the baptism of the Spirit hit me, I'm telling you that you couldn't talk me out of this no matter how much, how smart you are and what good a lawyer you are, how well you can argue. I'm going to tell you the power of the Spirit of God is as real as the pew you're sitting on. You can touch it. You can feel it. It's, it's real. It's in you. It has results. And, and I, I'm a believer in Jesus as a man, 
fully man, had needed the Spirit of God from God the Father to empower him and make him full. And then you look, look down to Luke chapter 3, go back to 3, 21 and 22, and it talks about uh, this also where it says when Jesus is baptized. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended up him in, upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven saying, You're my beloved son, and you I'm well pleased. See, we all need the Holy Spirit. We all need him upon us, in us, through us filling us, empowering us. We need to be spirit-filled. Jesus was spirit-born. He was spirit-filled. This is a Holy Spirit Christmas, this Jesus. And then he was spirit-anointed. Look at Luke 4, starting in verse 18. He was spirit-anointed. Verse 17 says, In the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, speaking of Jesus, and Jesus opened the book and found the place where it was written. And he's quoting, he's reading Isaiah. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown, but I say to you a truth. There are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, and when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when the great famine came over the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Let me tell you, Jesus is saying, let me, let me tell you, don't question my will and who I am. You may not accept me, they may not accept me, and they may say, well, where, how come this is happening to me and question me and accuse me, but it doesn't mean I'm not real and I'm not Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one, and that I have the power to heal. And even though I may not heal everyone, there's reasons. I have the power to set free, even though some still are in captivity, and, and the, but the Spirit is still upon me and has anointed me. See, Jesus was anointed. He received the Holy Spirit, and he did his ministry through the whole role. It was a part of the the Holy Spirit in which a Messiah means anointed one and Jesus was the Messiah and he was anointed, he was spirit anointed and to be clear being the incarnate word of God does not make Jesus the Messiah, it's the spirit that makes Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Greek word Christ and the Hebrew word Messiah both mean the anointed word. In the Old Testament, the Israelites expected the Messiah to be the anointed with the Spirit. And when Jesus started his ministry, he was filled with the Spirit at baptism. He was led by the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit when he went into ministry. And he affirms Isaiah's prophecy that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's, a, he's anointed me to bring good news, to preach. And I noticed how many times Luke says, Jesus preached, Jesus preached, Jesus preached. And he wants us to speak the truth. And finally, he, Jesus' spirit was a spirit, was identity was from the spirit. And our identity is from the spirit. God has unique things for us to do. His gifts are numerous and his spirit empowers those gifts. And our identity is not our humanity and our flesh and our, and our human efforts and our human accomplishments and our human gifts, but the spirit identity that God puts on and through us. In Luke chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, Verse 10 says, the angel said to them, do not be afraid, but hold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Verse 11, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you, look at three words, a Savior, Savior, who is Christ, Christ, the Lord. Savior, Christ, and Lord. And you see it over and over in every gospel, Savior, 
Christ and Lord. The biblical stories of Jesus' birth aren't true, aren't there rather, just to tell us about how Jesus came into the world. They're there to remind us of Jesus' identity. The angels told the shepherds, Jesus was not just any baby. He was Savior, yes, and he was Messiah, yes, and he was Lord. And the Spirit is central to both who Christ is and what he did. The Holy Spirit. The Spirit enabled the incarnation of the Son of God. The Spirit empowered Messiah, the Messiah who came to bring redemption to the Israelites and to us, even the whole world. And likewise, the central, the Spirit rather of God is central to both the Christian identity, my identity, and my action. The Spirit gives believers new life. The Spirit gives us as the children of God anointing as we can then be spirit empowered to minister for Jesus. And let me tell you, Christmas is about God in us and God with us. And we need God.